humans. Um, I wanted to do, this is the video of um, how I use my Glowforge to make the blanks for my silicone mold business. And um, I am not familiar with how to edit for videos for YouTube. So at this point in time, I'm pretty sure that all of the text on my things is going to appear backwards to you. Um, if I can figure out how to flip that, I will. Uh, in the meantime, bear with me because I don't know how to edit anything. So there's probably gonna, um, I'm gonna try to do a thing and then pause the video and then you know go to the next step. We'll see how well it goes. It might not be very fluid. I'll try. Um, so the first thing I've done is I have cut my blank on my Glowforge for the mold that I'm going to make today. And when I, I'm going to go ahead and assume that you pretty much know how those functions of your forge work. I am not using proof grade materials because I got lucky and a medical office was getting rid of all of the COVID sneeze guards that they had purchased. So I inherited all of their acrylic. That's what I'm using. Um, when I cut my acrylic though, I do use the thick, what is it, thick acrylic settings. And I tell my forge to go over it two times, twice, which makes my engraving a little bit deeper and it makes it a little more finished. I also cut on um, HD, I think it's the HD image setting because the draft settings do leave behind texture. That I don't want. Okay, so now that I have my blank, the first thing that I like to do is I go over it with a toothbrush to get out any of the dust that has been left behind by the cut process. You might want to do this wearing a mask. Um, I don't. Personal choice. That's up to me. And one of the first things I do when I do my blanks, I mask the front and the back because otherwise I get that honeycomb texture, um, which can kind of melt through and score the backside of my piece. And I like to use Gorilla brand um, duct tape to lift off my masking. And I know that they make this in at least two colors. Oh, so hard to tear. Um, I have it in the black and the silver, and the black seems to be more sticky, so it works better for this application. And I just take my piece and I put the tape right over it and I smooth it on and then lift it. And if I'm lucky, it will start to peel off the masking for me. Be right back. Okay, so now I have taken all of the masking off of my piece and gotten most of the dust off. This is the uncut, the not engraved side, but you can see uh, what the engraving will look like because guess what, that's the mirror of this. Next, you're gonna need a frame. And because I am a mold maker, I just make myself a bunch of different frames and it's two pieces of acrylic and I cut them out at the same time so that they're the same dimensions and then I glue them together with super glue or nail polish in a pinch. Um, there of course are acrylic adhesives that will actually force the acrylic to bond. I don't use that. I don't have that kind of time. Um, but I make just an assortment of frames and then use them for all sorts of different things. One thing that you could do with your piece is if you tell your forge to create an outline then create an additional outline until you get that second outline that will give you, you know, a perfectly shaped um, dam or barrier and then cut two of those. And I have found that if you cut two and you cut one the same thickness, I'm using thick, the same thickness as the acrylic you're using, and then the second one out of thin acrylic then you don't have to be quite so worried about whether or not the surface that you're using to work on is level because any unlevel silicone will just pour over the side of your barrier. So next I'm going to show you how to set up your blank inside your barrier. Okay, my tripod does not like this tilt. 
So if anybody has suggestions on how to get a tripod that will also tilt forward, let me know. That would be great. Um, a few things that I use to kind of cheat um, the system is you're going to need a few little pieces of foam that are thicker. And these actually come at most craft and hobby stores. And I get this thickness in the, a kid's pack that is designed to be um, turned into door hangers. You know, like the Do Not Disturb or Emily's Room. Um, I buy those and then I cut them up. And you're going to want to make sure that your blank is put in carved side face down. And then I kind of feel like, does that feel like it's level? It does, actually. Next comes your packing tape. And you're going to use your packing tape to tape your blank into your frame. And you want to work from the center of your blank outward to try to smooth out any bubbles that you can get. Because bubbles between your blank, when you fill it with silicone, it'll be like this. And any bubbles underneath will make your mold sit off kilter. So we're going to do this real quick. Be right back. Okay, so I have my pieces of tape down. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a pencil eraser and use it to kind of buffer my piece. I want really, really good adhesion between my blank and my tape, especially around the edges of the piece. I don't want silicone to leak in underneath it. And I still continue to work with this over the foam so that it gets support from underneath because I am pushing down on it. So we'll just go over that. Especially around like where your keyhole, your keychain hole will be. You don't want silicone leaking in there either because it will disfigure the peg that is produced in your mold. And then we go around the edges of the barrier as well, all the way around. Be right back. One trick I can give you is I usually like to work on top of a piece of tile. And that's because when my mold is full of silicone, if I need to pick up and move it to another place. I'm not depending on the tensile strength of scotch tape to hold everything together. And it's just much more secure. Plus when you have a calamity and everything leaks everywhere, because it does happen, it's it makes cleanup pretty easy. So now that my blank is inside my barrier, I have all of this tape everywhere. And I like to cut that off just so that when I'm crash working with multiple molds all at the same time, I don't run the risk that they will stick to each other if I push them too close to each other. It just cuts down on bloopers some. It depends. If you're incredibly accident prone like me, there's always the chance that something else will go terribly wrong. So we're going to trim that off real quick. And one of the last things you want to do before you start working with your silicone is make sure that your blank, that your blank is very truly dust free because any imperfections, I think that might make it easier to see, any imperfections or dust that are in your blank at this point in time will be in your final mold. Watch out for pet hair. Pet hair is a doozy. So I'm going to look, make sure that we're nice and dust free here. And we're not. I'll be right back. So here's a tip that's kind of an insider tip. Um, anytime you have scrap silicone, this stuff is actually great for cleaning up dust and especially glitter because everything sticks to it. And when you're worried about fingerprints, like we are, because fingerprints will transfer through to your mold, and then you'll have a forever mold with fingerprints in it. Yes, there are several of those out there in the world that are my fingerprints. We just hope those don't ever show up at a crime scene or something. Too many, too many episodes of Dexter. So you can use a piece of scrap silicone to clean up that dust. And then that's trash. So we are now ready to mix our silicone to put in our mold. And I use smooth on slow 15 platinum cure and 
in a trial size container. This is how I dress my jugs because they get drippy and it's yucky. Um, but in the trial size container, it looks like this. So it's Mold Star series. This is part A, part B is sitting over there. And it's the Platinum Cure Slow 15. So let me put a paper towel back around this because it's yucky. Be right back. So when I order my silicone, because I actually order it in uh, buckets like this, I get two of these buckets with each order. Um, then I stir this, struggle to open the lid, stir this, and then I pour from this into this smaller container just for ease of use. And um, it always comes with like a product list of what their other things are and all of their, um, you know, their fact sheets and the different temperatures and, you know, comes with all of that stuff. And a cold weather advisory because cold, cold, if your silicone gets cold, it doesn't cure correctly. So, um... I'll include a link for that down in the comments. And then I use these cups. I've had these same cups for about eight months, I think now. I've used a set of 20. And I just let the silicone cure in the cups because cleanup is really easy. And then you can use it again. As long as the inside of your cup does not have any uncured silicone in it and is free of you know debris and cooties then you can use these cups again and these are prep store brand and you want to make sure you use a, a measuring cup that has exact measurements not rough measurements so here we go we're going to mix equal parts of part a and part b And we're going to stir it with a wooden stick. For these cups, popsicle sticks are too short. So I actually use wooden tongue depressors, like medical grade. And you want to make sure that you're stirring thoroughly. You want to get, you don't want any white streaks or any blue. And you don't want to whip it. Do not stir it like it was an egg. You will introduce more air into it. That's not the goal. Um, one of the things I really like about these cups, too, is you can look and make sure you have good, you know, coverage on the sides and the edges and stuff. So it is kind of important that your vessel is transparent, is see-through, so that you can see what it is you're doing. Okay. Stir, stir, stir. And then what I do first, and this is totally not required by the product or anybody else, this is just my technique that I've learned through trial and error, is I like to dribble some on, especially over any words or like these little salt specks. And I'm gonna give that a minute, just smooth it. When you're smoothing, do not scrape your piece of acrylic. Do not do that. This is much more like icing a cake. You're just gonna float your silicone over the piece. And the reason we're doing that at this point is we're looking for air pockets. I do have a vacuum chamber. Um, I do occasionally use my vacuum chamber. I do not use my vacuum chamber enough to justify what I spent on it. It's one of those tools that I purchased at the beginning because everybody says, oh, you have to have one and I haven't gotten nearly enough use out of it to make it worth the purchase. What my preferred tool is, is a severely mangled toothbrush, paintbrush, Q-tip sometimes. You can usually pull most of the silicone out of those. They're very sad, but that's okay. And I use my paintbrush to make sure that my silicone gets painted into all of these little spaces. And what you're just looking for is full contact of the silicone. And I kind of push it around and I'm looking for any 
bubbles. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. So now that we're at this part, and I don't believe I have it, like there's a little bubble, I see you. I don't believe I have any issue with there being bubbles trapped inside the text. The other thing is when you just put it on real thin like that, you can flip it over and proof from the inside. Because if there is a bubble, you'll see it's a dark spot. And the silicone doesn't yet have enough quantity to pour out all over your hand. But it will in just a minute. So now you just, the instructions say to start at the lowest point and pour from the lowest point and allow it to well up. My personal experience is that that's actually not ideal. I like to pour from the middle and allow it to push outward. I do intentionally change the pattern of my pour with you know back and forth and zigzags because if there is any that's pour, not mixed well, you can kind of entrap or enrobe that at this point and you can also see it. You can see like the striations and it does give you the opportunity to fix it before it's too late and your mold has come to full cure which takes about four hours, depending on the ambient temperature of the room. You can heat, um, you can put it in a warmer environment, which I have done. Usually I do it by providing a heat pad underneath and that helps, but you're much more likely to get bubbles in your final product. And we don't want that. I want it to take the full four hours to cure so that all of the bubbles will lift up. And that's it. That's how you make your first silicone mold in four hours. This will be ready to take apart and I will do a second video. But now you just have to set this on a surface that is truly level because if your surface is not level, your mold will not be level, which means your all your future products will be crooked as well. So this now goes on a flat surface over there and tomorrow I'll do another video and I will unmold this and will problem solve anything that's come up. If you have any questions, ask me in the comments below. Let's see if I can do this. Ask me in the comments below. I'm happy to answer anything. Um, if there's something specific you want to see, let me know. I'm happy to share that information too. And, um, oh, you wanna see what I make? So this is a heart made out of resin and it's got real flowers in it, true florals. I do these kinds of things and I'll show you how to do those if you're interested. Pop sockets, all sorts of fun stuff. So, um, Hit me with your comment, any questions, any comments, and I will include a link below for the silicone and the measuring cups and the wooden stir sticks that I use. I'm not an affiliate. I don't get paid for anything. I just want to share with you guys. Hope you're having a great day.